for a moment this morning about shotgun passing game. We we'll tell you a little bit about uh, how we got into the shotgun passing game at Florida State. Give you a little bit of history behind it. Tell you about the need for a shotgun passing game, and also get into some ideas uh, that you may be able to incorporate into your into your football programs. Uh, we got into the shotgun passing game at Florida State merely by accident, in a sense. Uh, we had been playing uh, Miami and the University of Florida for a number of years, and each year that game was coming down to the last couple of plays. So what we decided to do is concentrate basically on one particular phase of the game. What we were trying to do was trying to win one football game. And that was the one football game that we were losing every year. And we were trying to find a way to win that particular football game. And each year that game was coming down to a field goal. So what we wanted to do was try to maximize our chances for winning that particular football game. And so we started working on uh, a one minute offense. Something that you work on only in case you're behind at the end of the game. So that's how we kind of evolved into it. So one spring, we decided to just work on every single day for the entire spring practice. We devoted a portion of that practice to a one minute offense, trying to score at the end of the game, trying to score at the halftime. We had no uh, idea of, did not envision of using this thing for a whole game. So what we did at that particular time was each and every day we started to work on it. We started playing the year which was uh, Charlie Ward's junior year. We were going along with our base offense. We were going sprint, draw, sprint, draw, pass. But the problem was in our first four ball games, our quarterback had thrown 13 interceptions. And that was not his thing. So what we were trying to do then was figure out what we could do to get this thing going, to get our quarterback turned around, to put ourselves in a position where we would not be losing football game, even though despite the 13 interceptions, we had not lost a football game. What happened at that particular time is that we went to play Georgia Tech. Georgia Tech was up on us. We, they were about eight, 18 points up going into the fourth quarter. So the geniuses that we are, we decided to go to the one minute offense and what happened, we went right down the field and scored. We were in within a touchdown of winning the football game. So now we're smart guys, so what we decided to do now, we decided to go back to our sprint draw pass and, and sprint draw game. Well, when we did that, it was three and out. We came back again three and out. So we said, hey, let's get out of this thing and let's open it up. So what we did at that point, we just, for a basketball player, we just spread it the floor, or spread it the football field, and just put everything out in front of him, dropped him back as if he were a point guard on a basketball team and opened everything up for him, snap it back to him and just let him look at everything as he was moving around. And that's how we got started. So we came back and we won the Georgia Tech football game basically by putting him in the shotgun, letting him sit back, letting him see the whole field, and then moving down the football field. The next game we were playing Virginia, we said, okay, let's come out in this thing and let's see what we can do. But what happened in that particular football game was that it was a cold, <laughs> wet night. So what we did at that particular point, we had to put it on hold. What we did at that point was go back to our sprint draw. And what we have always tried to do, even in South Carolina, in recruiting is, and if we did it at Florida State, is that we want to have a set or a back that we can run when it's cold, windy, muddy, and rainy. So we're going to constantly work on that running game. But again, we want to have a set that we can go to when the weather is nice, we got a good playing field, and the other people are better. So what we want to do is incorporate those two ideas. So in Virginia, we ended up winning the football game like 13 to 3 because it was a bad day. We wanted to come out in the no huddle, but we could not. The next week, we were playing Maryland. 
Maryland is noted for their no huddle. So as coaches and as players, the adrenaline started to flow. These guys are no huddle specialists. So what we want to do, we want to get into no huddle and try to show them a little something. So at that particular point, we came out in the no huddle. And once we got out into the no huddle, we ended up scoring 70 points the first time we got into it and stayed into it. From that point on, the rest of the year, we went on and we played the no huddle all the way. We, uh, I think we lost one football game again, and that was to Miami. The reason we lost that football game to Miami is because we did not know all of the protections, all of the intricacies that you needed to know out of the no huddle. So we were still in a learning process. So you have to think about now of going through that whole year in this particular offense. Now you get to the last game of the year. We're playing my, uh, uh, Nebraska for the first time in the Orange Bowl. Why did we win that football game the first time? Why? Because it rained. It was simple. It rained. We had been in a no huddle. We've been working the no huddle. We've been moving the no huddle. Now we start practicing in Miami, getting ready for the football game. All we're practicing is no huddle. Then we say, well, we need to start working on our running game some. So we started incorporating our running game out of the no huddle and going back to some eye backs and sprinting. It rained. We cannot get in the no huddle. So now we get back into our two back set. Nebraska is sitting out waiting for us to go no huddle. And they didn't change all night because they hadn't worked on it. And that was the difference in the football game. Now, I'll tell you something about change, and I'll tell you about the next year. Now, you have to look, give you two examples of Florida State and Nebraska. As far as taking an offense like this and, be willing, and being willing to incorporate it. Florida State was number two, three, four in the country. We had finished in the top five in the country for about seven straight years before we went into no huddle. Our offense was one of the best in the country. Nebraska. Nebraska had been a winner every year with the kind of defense that they were playing. They changed it for one game. Now, why do I say that? We were good. We were very good. We were winning 10 football games every year, but we wanted to win one football game to win it all. What did we have to do? We had to get out of conference zone. And that zone was doing sprint drawing the things that we knew best and to get into something that our quarterback could do that would help us to win it all. And we won a national championship basically by changing. What I, why do I say that? Because what happens is you get to a point where you're winning and you're not willing to change because I'm winning every year. But what do you, do you want it all? That was our question. Do we want it all? If we want it all, we got to change to win one more game. Why I bring up Nebraska? Nebraska was one at running a certain defense every single year until they played Florida State that first year in the Orange Bowl. They changed. They changed because of our speed. They changed. What happened after they changed? After we won it, they came back and won it the next year. What does that say? they were willing to change to win one football game. We were willing to change to win one football game because we knew that we had to win that one game to win it all. Now, we came back the second year in the of the championship year. What we were trying to do at that point, we went up to the Buffalo Bills and some other places, and they were, be they were running the football out of the shotgun. So what we tried to do now was incorporate some runs in order to keep people off balance. Also, people were starting to blitz this thing. So the, the way that they wanted to stop it was to put everybody on the line in the blitz. In our practice sessions, what we do, we spend our first 15 to 20 minutes of practice, depending on what day it is, working on nothing but the blitz. So our players will know what blitz is coming. And we can have a plan for every conceivable blitz that they could bring. So what happened after we started working on this? People refused the blitzes. They refused the blitz. Why? It was a matter of how do you want to get beat? Do you want to slow us down and let us score 40 points? Or are you going to blitz and we're going to, we're going to break that clock? And basically, that's what it amounted to. Why? 
because we had enough confidence, our players had enough confidence in what they were going to do. Now, what happened now, you said, well, this is a concept that, that you've got to have great athletes in order to be able to cooperate. You've got to have a Charlie Ward. You've got to have all these fabulous receivers and all of this thing, all of these kinds of things. What happened? You come to a, a South Carolina that was not a winner, that did not have the kind of athletes that they had at, say, a Florida State, and you come in and you bring the same idea into it we won our first bowl game. Why did we win our first game? Because we were outmatched physically by other people. We could not stand up by going against people and trying to run the football every down. Our lineman, uh, one of our starting linemen, he felt, he felt real good. Believe it or not, one of our starting linemen was bench pressing 285 and he was walking around bragging about it when we got there. That's the kind of football players that we had. Now, we had to change a whole concept and a whole idea as far as trying to go to the shotgun offense. What was the first thing that we wanted to do? The first thing we had to do was sell them on this particular idea of this offense. Now, where do we start? You start now, you say you gotta have a good center. One of the things that we wanted to do with the center is to be able to work on that shotgun snap every day. Every day before practice, that center has to go out and work on that shotgun snap. If you saw us this past year, that snap was going all over the place. But we refused to stop. That ball was on the ground. It was going. We were working shotgun from the one-yard line coming out. Why? Because that's the only way we could get it out there. If we lined up toe-to-toe, -to -toe, they were going to knock us back in that end zone with that 285-pound bench presser. We had to get up there and we had to snap that thing. That ball went over the quarterback's head. He's jumping back trying to get it, and we got out of it. We went down the field and scored. Why? Because that's what we had to do. That was the only way we could get it done. Now, why did it help us again? It helped us again because of our quarterback. You're saying, well, you got to have a Charlie Ward. you got to have a mobile quarterback, a quarterback who can run. No. We had a quarterback that was not good on taking drops, not good on setting up. So what do we do? We say, well, let's not drop this guy back because he can't get back. Let's just put him back here and let him go from here. Let him throw from that particular spot. Now, what happens now, you, you, again, you're looking, and you're looking at, well, he can't get it all the way down the field. People say, well, why don't you guys throw deep? Again, as coaches, you know what you can do. And people say, well, throw it deep. You need to go deep. Why throw it deep? We don't have anybody that could go down there in the second place. The quarterback can't get it down there. <laughs> so the thing is, what you have to do is coach. You have to know what you can do. You have to know your limitations, and you have to incorporate around your quarterback and your wide receivers exactly what they can do. So the thing that we were going to do, we were going to incorporate the Florida State no huddle, fast break, Charlie Ward's offense, and bring it to South Carolina, what we did, we modified it for the quarterback. We modified it for the wide receivers. One of the mistakes that we made, uh, we would be sitting there looking at film, getting ready to play a game, and what would happen is we were making a mistake. We were preparing game plans as if we had Florida State football players. And we were going out there, and we were trying to figure out what's happening. Why can't this do it worked at Florida State? Yeah, we're, but we don't have those players. Once we realized that, that's when we started changing and modifying the whole concept of everything to fit what we had. Uh, different coaches come in, and they want to visit, and they want to know, well, what can we do? And the thing is, uh, we've got Coach Reeves now who's coming in from the University of Florida. And the first thing you tell remember, it's going to look good on film. When you watch the opponent, you're going to say, man, look at all these things we can do. But you've got to remember one thing. You don't have those players. And the thing that we have found with this passing game, it's an equalizer. You don't have to have the big horses up front. You can equalize things. Now, we talked about the quarterback. We talked about the center. Now, in terms of getting into the no huddle, how can you, you say, how can you do these things from the line of scrimmage? What about the, the center snap? When does the center snap the ball? What we do basically is go to a kick. 
We get the quarterback get back. Once he kicks down, Seneca can snap, snap the ball anytime he wants to. Now, we took that a, a step farther. What we eventually started doing is getting the center the call hike. Why? We get our lineman now. If you watch the lineman, what we want to do with our lineman, people sit out here and they hold hands and they do like this, and they don't know what's going on back in there. What we've done now is that we've turned our lineman in, and we've got them looking down at the ball. Now, once that center gets down and he raises up and he's ready to call hike, now he turns around and he's ready to go. What he's going to do is watch for his indicator before he turns. What we're trying to do is eliminate those people jumping and making us move offside. So we're going to snap it that way. Now, how do you communicate? How do your players know what play is going to be run? What we've gone to are hand signals and code words to tell us what play. One word will give the line of protection. One word will tell everyone what we're going to do. For an example, in no huddle, we want to run a protection. For an example, uh, we want to run a, uh, what we call a, a base protection. What we, you, all of you have certain numbers that you have on your protections. For an example, we've, we wanted to run a 50 protection. So what we did, we looked on our football team. Number 50's name happened to be Ronnie. So what do we call our protection? Ronnie. We want to call our sprint draw protection. Our sprint draw protection off of the sprint draw out of no huddle, how do we want to call that? Our tailback is Brandon Bennett. So all we do is call our sprint our protection Brandon. So what happens now when you come to the line and the quarterback, if you ever wonder what the quarterback is saying first, he'll walk to the line, he's got his play, he'll just call Ronnie, Ronnie, Ronnie. That's it. He walks back now. He'll tell the receivers, oh, we want to go sprint draw when they shift and go. He'll just walk up, call Brandon, Brandon. Now they know that it's a sprint draw protection. And believe it or not, they don't bust it. Why? Because I've taken away the numbers of trying to remember those, and I've give them, given them names that they can associate with their teammates. Now, how do I want to call some of my plays? For an example, on my running plays, how do I call my running plays? If I want to call my running plays out of the no huddle, for an example, on the sideline, I'll signal the play into the quarterback. Basically, what we're going to do is put the formation to the field every time. We want to run a running play, we just go this. It's Tarzan. Tarzan. So my isolation coming up to the strong side, he just looks on the sideline, he sees this, all he does is walk up there, Tarzan, Tarzan. Now everyone knows that we're running the ISO strong. What, what happens now if I want to come back and run the ISO weak? Who's Tarzan's mate? So I just walk up and call it Jane, Jane. Now I'm running the ISO weak. So I have, I'm not going to teach them numbers. I'm not going to say this is... 42, this is 43, this is 14, or whatever you want to call it. I'm going to give them the name so they walk up there. The lineman will run it or learn it that way. This is Tarzan. This is Jane. Now, I want to come back. Now, I want to run my sprint draw, say sp strong, and I want to come back and run my sprint, sprint draw weak. So when I come up to run my sprint draw strong, so when I come up now, my sprint draw is Brad. Why is my sprint draw Brad? because Brad Scott is the head coach, and that's his favorite play. So what we come up to the line, and the signal, we do this. Why? Because he has the whistle. He's the man. So we just walk up there, the line want to know what the play is. We just walk, Brad, Brad. Everybody knows what the play is. We're not getting, they're already set. We want to come back and run the same play to the weak side, sprint draw to the weak side. Who's his mate? Daryl. So we just come up, walk up there, say, Daryl, Daryl. We run the play. Now we want to take it outside. We want to take it outside. The kids came up with the name. For an example, now we want to go to the strong side. We want to run the handoff to the strong side outside. We come up, Homer, Homer. We want to come back to the weak side. Who's Homer's mate? Marge. So we come back, Marge, Marge. Now we're coming back to the weak side. So what we've done, we've tied up those plays like that 
so the players would know them. Uh, we even got to, uh, 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 when we want to we wanna toss, for an example, we want to toss the ball strong, or we want to toss the ball weak, then if we want to come strong on a toss, we come up with Andy. Andy, who's Andy? Andy's last name is Taylor. Andy Taylor, Andy Griffith Show. So we come up with Andy Taylor. Now we want to come back weak with the T on the end, so we come back with B, B. That's Aunt B. So B, Taylor. So the B tells them we're coming weak. The Taylor tells them it's a strong uh, a toss coming out the weak side. So what we tried to do is incorporate names like that into the no huddle. Why? Because when we start talking about 951 right, 267 left, and they go, uh-huh, yeah. But in the no huddle, we can incorporate all of that and keep moving. Now, you say, well, the passes get tricky. How can you incorporate your passes into the no huddle? Simple. We want to run, for an example, I'm going to show you a couple of plays. We want to run an outcut. We call the outcut, for an example, a bench, which is going out. Why is it? Because we're going out towards the bench. So we want to call the bench. You want to call the bench in no huddle. You want to tie it into your Ronnie protection. All you, the signal that you would give on the sideline, because you just do this. That's all you have to give. If you, the quarterback, the signal you've given, you don't have to give him the protection. Once he learns it, he knows that in certain wide receiver sets, you got certain protection, and you do that. People say, well, you steal your signal. How are they going to steal that? Well, that's all he got. Now he's going to walk up to the line. He just go, Ronnie, Ronnie, Ronnie. And he look at the receivers. Everybody's got to play. Why? Because I've told him we're going to run the bench. The receivers and the tight ends, the tight end will look inside. They see that. They know it's bench. Now, I want to change it. I want to go vertical. I want to get stretched down the field. How do we stretch it down the field? I just take this little finger here and drop it to the side like that. And now they know that we're going to run a takeoff. Just that, takeoff. Why? Because we tried to simplify it and make it as easy as possible. Okay, now we want to come back. I'll show you these patterns. We want to come back for an example. Now, what we like to tie into out of our running game is that when we start running inside, we want to be able to tie a pass in case that linebacker want to move out or come inside and play the run, we want to be able to throw a pass to that wide receiver. So I come back with my pass now. The Y on the option. And so simply we run Y option. Quarterbacks give the signal, Y option, Y option. We come to the line, Ronnie, Ronnie. Now we run into play. Now, what we've tried to do is try to incorporate all of those into our passing game. Now we want to throw the football to it, for an example, to Z. We want to throw the football to Z. We're in the same set, and we want to throw a pass to Z. On the sideline, what you do is go, and he's got the whole play. One, you've told him that I want to go, for an example, in this particular set, I want to go a 500 protection. If I want to go a 500 protection as an example, and I need a code word for that particular protection, what kind of race do they have? They have the Daytona 500. So I don't call 500, just walk up to the line and say, Daytona, Daytona. And they notice the 500. You got the firecracker 400. Firecracker, firecracker. Darling, darling, <clears throat> Speedway. So we have code names like that for our offensive line so they can, exact, they can remember the protection of what they're going to do. Now, <clears throat> I want to get into a wide receiver set, a shotgun set, and I want to bring my Z in on a pass pattern. I come to the line, Daytona, Daytona. Everyone knows exactly what to do. Why? Because this tells everyone what to do. I want to run another pass. I want to bring my X in on a specific play now. Daytona, Daytona. Everyone has to play. Now, what happens now, during the course of the no huddle, <clears throat> you do not have to speed the no huddle up. You can incorporate the no huddle as slow pace. What you're trying to do is keep the pressure on the defense. 
to keep them from subbing. What you can do now to change the pace of your no huddle is to incorporate a couple plays together that they will memorize that they can run. You can change how many receivers you have on the field and you can change the running back sets. How do you do that? You do that by packaging five plays together. You package five plays together. You say, well, these guys can't remember five plays. We put five plays in together on Thursday and then Saturday we'll run them. Why? Is because the way that we memorize them is that the right tackle, you've got, you've got the first one. Right guard, you've got the second one. Center, you third. Guard, you fourth, you fifth. So when they come to the line, the right guard is saying, okay, this time we're in Daytona. Right guard is saying, okay, this time we got Barney. We got Barney. <laughs> now the center comes back. Now this time we got X on a cross. And so we go down the line. So they don't, they just, one guy just tell them what the play is. And we're running to the line every time and going. And the quarterback just looks at the side, he gets that, and he can just call it real quick, and he can move. That way we can change the pace of how we're running it. Now, what happens when they start subbing a lot of people in and out of your no huddle? We've, uh, when Sam White was at Cincinnati and at Tampa Bay, we went to visit, and he was getting into a, a what he calls subway and these different things where he's moving people in and out. And you remember, maybe remember back the officials, were, they were stopping him from getting to the line and snapping the ball quick because he was catching the people on field. Well, we had experimented around with it and we said, well, this thing is not going to work in college football. This thing will never work. We can't get this done. We play Georgia Tech. Georgia Tech, do it to us. Get the ball on the three-yard line. So we said, well, maybe we need to rethink this thing. So we went back in the year that we won the national championship. We went back in. We scored four touchdowns just like that. This past year at South Carolina, we went to it. We scored three touchdowns. Why? We see them subbing, trying to get people in and out. And all we do before the play is called, for an example, first down, we run a play, we're looking on sidelines, say, hey, these guys are walking around. <laughs> and so we all get, we catch them next time. Who's walking? Who's going real slow? That guy over there, okay, let's put the ball. Now, what we do, let's put the ball on this hash so we can get him. So what we do, we say, okay, let's set this thing up. We will run the ball and actually get it on a hash so that we can go against that wide out over there. Why? Because he's the biggest loafer. So what we do, we end up running a sweep or something over here. Now we're coming back, okay, let's hit him. So now we come back with a quick play, which is the pass on that guy who's the biggest loafer. Now we're in the end zone. And the other coach is jumping on. What happened now is that we picked out your biggest loafer, and we're going right at him because he's not going to get out there and get set. And so what happened this past year? We scored three touchdowns by picking out the biggest loafer. At Florida State, we scored four. We played Nebraska for the championship game. We put the ball on the five-yard line by picking out one guy that was loafing and, going, and putting in the ball. What happens now is that you say, well, I don't want to waste the play. We will run a play to be successful, but we'll also run a play to put the ball on the exact hash that we want it on so that we can go at that guy over there. We will run plays to set up other plays. We went for, for an example, we went for three years setting up one play against one corner, cornerback by chance. And what happened, we played in the University of Florida, we playing a wide receiver who's now in the NFL, we ran an out. He almost picked it off. The second year we came back, we ran an out. He picked it off. The third year we came back, we ran an out and up. First play of the game, touchdown. Why? Because that same cornerback was coming up to get it again. And so three years, we're like, we gonna get this guy. Now, what happens now in, in working your game plan? Do not be afraid to go in and incorporate new ideas or new plays for each game. We were going to each game for an example. <clears throat> One year at Florida State, we beat South Carolina 59 to nothing. What happened? They played Georgia Tech the week before. When they played Georgia Tech the week before, they played two corners to a twin set. Whenever one receiver came inside and one went outside, they both jumped. 
the outside receiver. So what happened? We put in a play, told Coach Bowden, don't call it unless you want to score. He called it the second play of the game. He said, I wanted to score. <laughs> Why? Because we found a weakness. So what we'll do <clears throat> in looking and preparing a game plan, <clears throat> we will look for specific things in the secondary. How are you going to adjust the motion? <clears throat> if we put twins, will you jump both of them? And so we'll cooperate our ideas into those different things and try to do them. Now, what, what else will we do? In order to get our players motivated, we would name plays after them. We had a wide receiver, Matt Fry at Florida State. We wanted to run him on a reverse. Why? To, to, to make him feel good, to give him a bone. So what happened, we start working on the reverse in practice to him, the running back from the ball, we don't have to say a thing. He is getting on them. You know, this is my play, the running back fumbled at the second down. He pulled off his helmet, tears coming out of his eyes, and he jumped them. Why? Because that was his play, and he wanted to score. So we'll name our plays after our players to motivate them. Also, what we'll do is that we'll have in our game plan, how many times do you have great players, and how many times do you get them the football in the game? What we'll do in our game plan now is that we will incorporate into our game plan, for an example, we had Lawrence Dossie at Florida State, we had the Dossie plan. We had Vanna, we had the Van Over plan. That was how many ways can we get them the football? How many ways can, I can't tell you how many times I've been to football games to watch a prospect, the best player, the game is on the line, he never touches the football. Why? Because you're calling plays. The thing you have to do is put the football in your best player's hands if you want to win the football game. And that's what we do. We came up with a plan. If things are going bad, what do we want? I want to put it in his hands and let him do it. And so we incorporate a plan. We went and played Memphis State. <coughs> Had the Dossie plan. We said, okay, Dossie, we're going to give you the ball every single time. He's a wide receiver. Every single we threw him eight passes, and in eight passes, we were up 21 nothing. Why? Because we gave him the ball every single time. We've gone in the ball game. Some of you heard Sam White and his theory in terms of, uh, of stripping your plays. We have gone into games, and we have stripped it the first 15 plays. And we have run <coughs> the first 15 plays and did not third and short. Third and short, we got a pass on. Everybody's thinking wrong. We line up and pass. We're going down the field. Why? Because everybody, it breaks the tendencies. We've gone into games, and Coach Bowden said, do not throw a pass until I tell you to. Do not throw a pass. So we're sitting there. We're having fun. We've thrown 15 in a row. Quarterback misses the signal and runs the football. Now we're catching hell. Why? Because I said I wanted run a pass until I tell you to, to stop. So what we'll do in a football game, we'll, we'll go and we'll strip. How many passes can we run? How do we, how do we formulate all of these kind of things? Gave you a couple of, the, of the examples of some game plans. One, this was, at, uh, this was at the University of Miami for an example. What we have done we formulated a hit chart. We had a hit chart of all of our formations, and we put on there all of our plays, so we looked down this chart, and we knew exactly what we can run from each and every one. What we've done, for an example, this is one from uh, South Carolina this past year against LSU. These are all of our sets that we run, and what we've done is incorporate every single pass that we have, every run that we have, so on the sidelines, you wonder what's going on. We're looking and seeing what we got there. On the back, we go goal line, short yardage. We know exactly what we're going to run goal line and short yardage. Why? Because we have it here. We will strip it, and our players will go over everything in terms of that strip. Also, for an example, we'll have on this strip, we got to have one trick play every game. 
we will go into every single game with at least one trick play. Why? In case things are going bad, here to get your players going. For an example, this past year, you saw the throwback on the kickoff against Clemson. We were sitting, how did that come about? We were just sitting down in the office talking one night. Oh, you, you remember that time? Yeah, I remember that time. Do we have a tape on that? Yeah, we've got a tape. Oh, that's pretty good. Let's do it. So what happens, we started practicing four games ahead. Every day, every day we spend five minutes working on it. Every day we spend five minutes working on it. So what happens, four games later is when you want to use it. But we didn't start that week. We started working on it before. So now we get to them, and we're getting ready to run this play. We, no, let's not open the game with it. No, this kickoff is not right. No, this is not the right time. Half time, let's stun them. So what happens now is that we're standing there and we're saying, okay, are we going to do it? No, I'm, oh, mm, no, mm. <laughs> Coach Scott, John, what is it? Mm, nah, mm. And he said, well, I'm going to do it. I said, let's do it. And then I'm talking to the coach upstairs. I'm saying, watch number 35 all the way. If he goes inside, it's a touchdown. If he comes outside, we better start hiding. So 35 moves inside. I'm not looking at the football. I'm looking at 35 because if he goes in, it's over. 35 goes in. I say, oh, we got him. Then I see the tailback coming out. Why? Because you got one man to beat. That's the guy that's got contained. He came inside. It was over. So what happened? We did not wait until that game to do it. We started four games ahead of time. <clears throat> one example, other example before I get into some plays, we played Michigan. Florida ran a trick play on us the year before. We went a whole spring, five games in the regular season, working one play for that team. And that one play put the ball on a two-yard line and won the football game. We practice it all year. The thing is, when you practice them, you don't have to run them the <coughs> next week. You save them until you need them, and that's what we try to do. Now, what happens when you get into the, into the no huddle? A couple basic passes that you can run out of the no huddle. What I like to do is put Now, what I've done now is that if I have, if I have a third wide receiver, I'm going to take that third wide receiver and put him there. Why? Because he's used to running passes all day. He can penetrate the field a lot faster as opposed to putting a tight end that we started at South Carolina. Some of the other coaches said, well, this tight end is real good. He's a good kid. Let's put him right here. And coming from a different philosophy, I'm saying, no, I want a wide receiver right here. But no, this is the starting tight end. I don't care. I want him there. Why? Because he is the third best receiver. Again, you have to look at personnel. We took one of our best receivers and put him here at South Carolina. Why? Because we took our best one and put him there at Florida State. The first year he caught 74 passes. That was the kid, Kez McCarvey. This past year, I don't know how many he caught. Why? We put him here. Inside, who was he going to work on? Linebackers. Now, what we've also done, if you wonder why, for an example, at Florida State, Warwick Dunn is running by people. And we tried to do it with Brandon Bennett. Most people, when they line up, they put their full back here. And they put their tail back over here. We switched them. We put our tail back here and our full back over here. Why? Because more than likely, you're going to put your Sam backer, your toughest backer, right here. 
and you're going to put your drop in one that you want to be able to drop back in pass coverage, you're going to put him on this side over here. So why should I bring my best pass receiver in, uh, coming out of the backfield over here on a guy who's used to covering a passer? So what I've done is that I've switched them. And I've taken a Warwick Dunn and a Brandon Bennett, and I've taken it and I put him one-on-one -on, -one on your log cut in a sense of your rush linebacker, your run support linebacker. Why? Because he's not used to covering people. We won football games because people refused to move him. Why? Because they, he was their best linebacker. I'm going to leave my best linebacker in the football game. Yeah, you leave your best linebacker in the football game, but I guarantee you this guy here cannot run your best linebacker. And what we've done now is that we've created a matchup. We've created a matchup here. Believe it or not, in the last three years since we've been into this, people refuse to change. They refuse to take that big linebacker out, and so what we do, we just keep running that little tailback right up there on him. And what happens now, you got third down and about five, and you want to throw a pass, all you do is send that, back, that tailback up and out on that linebacker. He's gone. He can't beat him. What happened at the University of Florida when we played them? What happened at the end of the game? We put Warwick Dunn on a linebacker, and he was down the field, 80-some yards. What happened in the championship game? We played Nebraska for the championship. We took that same guy and put him on their best linebacker. Why? Because they wouldn't take him out of the football game. What did we do this past year? We took Brandon Bennett and put him on their best linebacker, run support, because why? They refused to take him out of the game, and we're just running patterns on him. Now, what we can do here, for an example, one of the passes that we like to throw out of this <coughs> is that we like to bring him up here, for an example, run the bench that we're talking about. We bring him up here on the out. We get him coming up in here, here. Now we take this guy here down the middle, okay? Now, simple pattern, simple pattern, we call it the bench. This was Florida State's best pass. This was South Carolina's best pass this past year. Why? We could protect it. We could send these people out. Now, what happens here? The quarterback will read a side, whether it's X or Z. He will look when he comes to the line, and he'll find basically the tightest coverage, or rather the, 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 the loose coverage. And he's going to throw the ball to that side. Now, what we will tell the quarterback, once you come up and you check the coverage, we will always like to work short side. We will always like to work short side. Why work short side? It's the shortest throw. It's the shortest throw. One thing that Coach Bowden did at Florida State is he drilled the quarterbacks on throwing that ball the shortest throw. Take the shortest throw. Why? Your percentage of completion goes up. So now we come back in this one, the bench, and we're going to take this throw here. One year, for an example, we had a guy here, Jesse Hester, who was a number one draft pick of the Raiders a while back. I think he's playing with the Rams now. We didn't take the short side throw. We had Tamari Vanover, for an example, a couple of years ago. We didn't take the short. What we did, we went there. Why? Because any one play may have been a touchdown. So what we're going to do is put the ball in the guy's hand who had a chance to take it the distance. So we got away. We want to throw it short side every time, but let's put it in his hands too if he can take it all the way. Now what happens now, they play, for an example, they give you a three deep coverage where he's backing out. You got your free safety in the middle. You got your corner backing out here. Now we can run this pass pattern. You got your wheel backing up. He's got to come and take him. You got your strong safety. He's going to run to the flat over here. What happens now if they change the coverage and he comes up here hard, 
he moves to the hash over here, you got him coming up and you got a, another safety on the hash, you got a too deep coverage now. That's the beauty of this play versus too deep coverage. Now, once the receiver comes off the ball, if he recognizes too deep coverage with this guy coming up, now he just faded. He come out and he faded upfield. So again, your quarterback has to look. If he has a soft corner on one side and a hard on the other, he's going to throw the ball on the out to the soft corner. Now what happens now, if both corners come up hard and you got too deep, we're going to hit the tight end, which is another wide receiver, down the middle. Down the middle. Why? Because we've decided that we want to throw the vertical every chance we get. Why? Your quarterback does not have to have a strong arm because this pass is going to be about 20 to 22 yards down the middle of the field. Easy reads for him. He's got to come up to get him. These corners are moving outside. That safety is moving on the hash. He takes that stem, move, and he's coming right into the middle of the field. Coming right into the middle of the field. Now, we will take this same, we will take this same play and we'll move it into our sprint draw protection out of our uh, uh, sprint draw fake and we'll throw the same one out of this particular action. Now, we can take this same concept of this same play we'll take this same concept we'll take that same concept and we'll move it into a four wide receiver set <clears throat> Now, by taking this same concept, <clears throat> what we have now is that I've got this. I've got this. I'm bringing him now through here. I've got my outs now on both sides again that I can throw. I'm still taking this guy here and putting him down the middle of the field. I'm still taking him and putting him down the middle of the field. Now, if I get the soft corners, I'm coming out one of these sides or the other. I'm still in the gun, and I'm bringing him up in here. Now, I can still go outside. If they play too deep, that's what I want them to play. I want them to go. They give, if they play soft, I can go out. If they go, if they go too deep, I lick, I start licking my fingers. Why? It's because this safety, they're going to stay on the hash. I'm getting him down here to take him out of here. He's got to come here and play this. I'm taking that linebacker. If he wants to drop back in here, I'm going to hit him. But when he comes down again, he's opening that big hole up in there for me. He's opening that big hole up in the middle for me. And I want to be able to hit this. Third down, we threw that all the time. The thing that we had to get out of in South Carolina was that every single third down, we were doing this. And people were starting to scheme us up. So what did we start doing? We started throwing it on first down. Why? Because they would give it to us on first down. They would give it to us on second down, but they would not give it to us on third down. So again, what we're doing now we get this guy here. We put a guy here who could just sprint and get down the field to get that backside safety out of there. If this linebacker here wanted to sit in here, then we open up the hole in the middle. If he wanted to drop back, now we could pop that guy right there and give him the football. So we had those two plays to complement each other. Now. We come back to the three wide out set. I'll show you this one first, and then we'll move to the other set to run it. Okay. 
we got this one from the the year that I think it was the, the first year the New York Giants won the Super Bowl. We went to New York and we got this one. Uh, when you had to beat us in the past, you had to stop this particular play. Uh, the Giants, we played Nebraska the first time in the Fiesta Bowl. We ran it two times in a row to win the football game. We ran it the first time to get the ball around the, the 35 or the 40 yard line. We were trying to figure out what to do next. Let's say, let's run it again. We came back again, we scored a touchdown. Why? What happens now is that you get this tight end, your wide receiver coming down eight to 10 yards and moving inside. You move your Z out. You, you change your alignment. You move your Z out wide. So what I've done now is that I've taken this guy here, <clears throat> and rather than keep him in near the hash, I've moved him, moved him out now to the top of the numbers. I moved him out to the top of the numbers, and I'm going to sprint him straight down the field, tell him to stay wide, and bring him in here 17 to 18 yards. Last year, as an example, because of the quarterback's arm strength, we cut that down to 15. And I'm going to bring this guy here over the top. I'm going to put this back here in the flat. He's going to check. Now he's going to the flat. Now what happens on this? <clears throat> you've got your free safety back in the middle. You've got your corner. You've got your corner. He's got to back out to take him. He's got to back out to take him. The strong safety now has to run down to get your back coming out here. This free safety has to come and get that. There's nobody else out there. He's got to come down and get it. Now, once he comes down to play that, your linebackers now are going to be in here, so he just works inside of him. And if he comes up the field with this guy inside, our running game is going to keep him honest. So once he comes down now, I've opened up a big throwing lane right in there. I've opened up a big throwing lane. If this guy want, if he want to come over and bracket here, if they want to bracket, put another guy and bracket this guy here, <clears throat> now I've got him working one-on-one. -on -one. I've got him working one-on-one. -on -one. So I look to find out who they're bracketing, and now I'll come with this. Now, <clears throat> The thing that we do off of this one is that, for an example, this is, a, this is what we call dip. This is dip. Dip is for double end post. Dip, double end post. Now, I'm running this play, and I've got them all coming down inside, and they're trying to stop this thing here. And I've got that good wide receiver running down here, so they've got to come down and pay attention to him. So what I can do now, once I find that they want to keep bringing him down to stop that, what I call now is dip Z post. Dip Z post. This past year at South Carolina, we only call it one time because we couldn't get it down there. We call it only once. We score it once. At Florida State, we call it three times. We score it three times. In other words, I'm saying we don't call it a lot. You call it once every, you know, three or four ball games. What happens now on dip Z post <clears throat> is that I get him coming down. When he's running the post, I've got to put him on a corner backside to take him and to make that safety man come out here. He's going to pull the other one out here. This corner is backing outside now. I just come down here, and I'm free coming on the inside. Why? Because that corner is backing outside. That safety is coming down the middle to get the tight end. I've got the other uh, wide receiver going outside, backside, <clears throat> to pull that corner and that safety man out of there. Now I can come down the middle of the field. I can come down the middle of the field. Again, that's, that's a changeup that you wouldn't use all the time, just you know, three or four times a year. You always keep it in your game plan, and when you see it's there, you take it. Another variation off of this one now is we come back. When we get them now trying to run inside to play the dip, and we catch that cornerback playing out by himself, 
we come back now with dip Z corner. So we're running the same play. They have not learned anything new. Now I come back, I get everybody moving inside. I start in here like I'm going to the post on him. He's running to get to the post. Now I bring it back outside. I bring it back outside, dip Z corner. How do I call the dip out of the no huddle? How do I call dip out of no huddle? I just walk to the line, Ronnie, Ronnie. Well, I got a dip in there. <laughs> and that's it. That's all he's going to do, Ronnie, Ronnie, and call the play. And everybody knows what the play is. Okay, now <clears throat> I can get this play here and get me downfield for an example on that one. <clears throat> now, Out of the no huddle, <clears throat> they're giving me in the middle of the field. They're giving me, I gotta have something now. <clears throat> in my passing, I wanna have a play that I can hit every single area on the football field. I can hit the right flat, left flat, left middle, I can go down to the medium. <clears throat> I've got plays designed to hit every single area on the football field. So I'm not sitting there trying to figure out, well, they're doing this and I need to go over here. No, I know what I can run to get over there. So what we've done, we tried to incorporate passes that can hit every single area of the football field. <clears throat> now I come back, I need to get something coming inside. I got my tight end again dragging over. Now I want to cheat my tight end down inside. <clears throat> now. What happens when he comes down inside, I've got to give him a landmark. I've got to give him a landmark coming over, depending on the pass pattern. As an example, if I'm going to run this guy on a square end backside, then I'm going to pull this guy up. It's six yards deep over my split tackle. If I'm going to run a pass pattern where I've got this guy here on a corner, then I'm going to take him all the way on the other side of the field, and I'm going to tell him to pull up at the top of the numbers to turn around and square his shoulders. How do I want him to square his shoulders? I do not want him to come over there and just turn around and sit. We do this with our backs, too. If the quarterback is in here, I'm not going to turn here and wait for the ball. I'm going to turn my shoulders here in an angle and wait for the ball. Not here, but in an angle to the quarterback. Why? When I catch the ball, I can see what's going on. If I turn it here, how many times that running back is bending way out wide and I'm losing ground because he won't go upfield. So I get him in an angle, catch the football. He's got a shoulder pass turned so he can see what's going on. Now I get upfield. <clears throat> also, when these guys catch the ball, <clears throat> they don't just catch it and they take off. We know exactly where they're going to go because we've told them where we want them to turn and where we want them to go when they catch the football. Why? Because we have told these people here, once the ball goes to here, we want you going here and blocking this guy here, and now you come on back in here because you've got a block here as opposed to just taking off and running. So in other words, we're going to tell them every time they catch the football where to go. And once this guy here catches the football in here, yesterday in an example, <clears throat> what we did, we worked on a dip and lift drill. Why? Because this guy here kept catching the football and would not turn it up. And when he turned it up, he went up that sideline <clears throat> and somebody nailed him. Why? Because he running like this. We came with drill. Every time you catch a pass in practice, we got someone down there with a dummy, and you better get your head down and dip and lift and bring it up. Why? We want him to be physical. We want him to be physical. Now, I've got him coming over here. I'm bringing this guy here inside at a depth of 15 yards deep. I'm bringing him inside at a depth of 15 yards deep. Now, I'm bringing him over the top, bring him around, bring him around here, and I've got this guy now over the top. I've got him over the top. So now, if they want to drop back <clears throat> and play me 
in a too deep zone, I'm going to this because I'm going to tie these people coming down here. I'm going to make these people come out to get those people there, and I'm going to create me a cavity on the inside that I can throw that score in coming in to the inside. What happens now if they go man coverage? If they play man coverage, I'm going to take a shot at that every single time. Now, again, it's a matter of the quarterback and it's a matter of your philosophy. At one place, we had a quarterback who could throw it. Every time we got man coverage and every single pattern that we had, we built in a post. Why? If you're going to go man, we're going deep. Every single time you go man, we're going deep. We changed that philosophy this past year because the quarterback couldn't get it down there. So in every single pass, we had a built-in out so that when they went blitz, I'm coming here every time. I'm coming here every time. And so what we've done is that we built it in. And every single pass that we have, what we've done is that we've gotten away from side adjustments. And every single pass, you know where the blitz is coming, we have what we call hot reads. The reason we go on the hot reads is so that people can't bluff us, is that we can still run our pass pattern. The quarterback knows that he has a hot read built into every single pass pattern. Now, you've heard a lot about the crosses. Uh, you've, you've seen uh, the 49ers, for an example. If you watch the, the playoff game in the Super Bowl this past year, you see Jerry Rice coming in on the cross. Uh, if you watch Buffalo when they won the Super Bowl, uh, they had the receivers coming in on the cross. Uh, you've probably seen now that a lot of the professional teams now, they're getting the offensive coordinators who have some kind of indoctrination with the San Francisco style of offense. Why? One simple theory of passing, that's the shallow cross series the shallow cross series. You want to take a quick break, Coach? Okay. Or just keep on going? We can what? Do what? Uh, we, these guys, I got these guys' oh, attention. Oh. I got their attention now, so I better keep moving. <laughs> okay, now, the shallow cross series. Uh, I will show you some of it, but in all honesty, I'm not going to show you all of it. Why? Because I got to keep a few secrets. But the thing that, the thing that a lot of people, again, why have all of these people in the NFL tried to get these people who have been indoctrinated in this kind of offense? It's because of this particular passing game. Why did the Bills get to the Super Bowl so many times? This one. Why did the 49ers? This one. This was the basis of our offense at Florida State. We have used some at South Carolina. The thing that we tried to sell the quarterback on at South Carolina is it went in and said, hey, listen, you can lead the SEC in passing if you just listen and do this. Don't, don't just follow your reads. The hardest thing to do was say, follow your reads. Go here, here, and here. Every time somebody's going to be open, but every time, oh, i got to come back over here. What we've done when we first started our first football game this past year, we put this in. And we said, follow your reads. Just follow your reads. And what happened? Every day he'd come back over here. We don't do it. Just follow it. And so we come back. We said, OK, we're going to run the same play again. Follow your reads. What did he come back over here again? And so what we trying to do, how can we do this now? How can we get this guy to follow the reads? So what we said, we'll do, OK, let's keep everything over here front side like we want it. And let's eliminate everything back side so he can't go over there. <laughs> And so what we've done now is that we forced his hand. We made him go where we want to by eliminating everything he had on the backside. Why? To make him follow the reads. Now, Bringing this guy inside, it's, it's going to look simple, but believe it or not, they can't stop it in the NFL, and the people we played can't stop it either. 
bring him inside. Simple three yard drag. This guy here runs a curl at 12. He's at three. This guy here runs a curl at 12. This guy here is checked. Now he's in the flat. He won't run into him because that ball is going to be thrown over in here and he won't get in his way. And you bring him outside. You bring him outside. Now, what happens on this? Say they're playing three deep. He's got to take him. <clears throat> He's going to have to take him. You got your free safety playing in the middle of the field. You got your strong safety. You got your backer in here. If he wants to wall that, now we got these two. So my first read is one. If that linebacker wants to wall it, if he wants to wall that, I go to two. This is two. If that strong safety wants to sit in the throwing lane, I go to three. I go to three. Now, what happens on this play? I get my Y on a shallow cross coming to the inside. I get my Z is going to run his pass patterns right behind that strong safety. He's going to run it right behind that strong safety. Why? Because somebody has got to get him. And once he comes to get him, now I got that. If he wants to stay back, then I got Warwick Dunn, Brandon Bennett out there. What I want here is somebody who's going to make somebody miss. When we first got into this, Coach Bowden, had, we had a back Sean Jackson. And Sean was catching this thing, and he was getting eight yards a pop. We as coaches were saying, no, we want Warwick done. And he said, no, this guy is getting eight yards a shot. We want to keep him in the ball game. So what we did, we slipped this freshman in the football game. And that freshman caught it, and he took it the distance. And he said, oh, I see what y'all talking about. Why? It's because I got one that can take it eight. I got one that can put it in the end zone. So what we wanted to do was get that one that could put it in the end zone in the football game. So I read him. Now, what happens now is I say, if he comes down, I go here. If he backs up the, the, just to the play in this area here, I come here right away. This is a two-yard belly, no deeper than two. Once he gets to that Z's alignment, he wants to start up field, turning the shoulder pass. You don't want the quarterback to throw in the ball here. You want to turn his shoulder so he can hit him in the numbers. Easy throw for the quarterback. Now, a key for the quarterback in looking at that strong safety and determining where he wants to throw the football. You look at the strong safety, strong safety is back pedaling, shoulder square. I'm coming out here. Strong safety now is moving shoulders parallel. I'm going back here to this wide receiver up the field. Now, what determines if I come backside on this? If they rotate the coverage strong, I'm coming back here. If they give me a blitz from this side over here, I've got my cross coming in. If they give me a blitz from this side here, I've got him hot. Turn the end down the line loose. I've got him hot. Again, we're practicing. If he comes, you're hot. Yes, you can block him. The thing that in watching some college teams is that what they'll do is they'll sit their backs in there to block. And they'll, they'll keep bringing those linebackers, or they will bring the linebackers to make you keep your backs in the backfield. What we'll do is send them out of the backfield, saying, yeah, you blitz, but we believe that we can get it to him before you can get to our quarterback. And we'll practice it, so why? 
we can do it. People stay back. It makes the game easier for us. Now, this is my Y shell across. How, how do I call my Y shell across? In my no huddle, I come to the line, I give them protection, Ronnie, Ronnie. And that's it. Why? That's a why. That's why. And everybody knows that, for an example, if I call this uh, 255, then everybody's going to learn on your team what 255 is. And they're going to run 255. But if I say this now is 255, then everybody's going to learn that. So now if I'm in no huddle, I just walk up there and do this. Now everybody knows what to do, and I snap the football. Why? Because I teach them the whole play just as you put numbers on it by using this concept here. <clears throat> now what I want to do I want to bring, I, I got my Y coming in. Now what happens if I want to bring my Z in? I got him coming here, here. I still got this backside. Now, what have I done now? All I have done now is exchange these two people here. I've exchanged those two people there. That's all I've done. Now the defense is sitting back and they're trying to figure which one is going to come in. So let's wall whoever comes in. Let's wall whoever comes in and let's jump the back and let's get this. But believe it or not, the they, one's going to be open just about every time. Now, what happens when they start wanting to wall this? I have other patterns that I show you that are complemented when they start trying to wall it. So again, this is my cross coming inside and in here. What the 49ers did, if you watch the playoff game against Dallas, this was Jerry Rice, and they ran the same play. All they did was put Jerry Rice here, quarterback was here, they brought him in motion and just brought him back side. All they did was dress it up. It's the same play. They just dressed it up a little bit with a little motion. They dressed it up. Now, the defense has to move over. Again, I've got my best receiver. I'm bringing him in motion, step, and he comes down. I'm still coming back in here with my cross. What happens now, I want to bring my cross from the weak side. Now, how do I, again, in no huddle, how, do I, how can I get into this if I want to run my cross again? Why? That means Z. That means Z. Basically, uh, again, you make them whatever you want. That means Z. So when I come to the line, I give them protection. Ronnie, Ronnie. Everybody's got to play. Everybody's got to play. Now I want to bring him from the weak side. I want to bring. If you line up in that right now, you bring the Z inside. Are you reading him one? Are you reading strong? Are you going all the way down? I'm reading him one. This ball would be completed in this area here. This will not be completed over here. Yeah, I'm still reading my Z is one. That strong safety now is going to be over here. The strong safety has to come on this side over here. Someone has to move out here with him. When he goes in motion, two things will happen when he goes in motion. One, the linebackers will step over a step, and everybody's going to start backing up. What I've done now is that I've told my quarterback that it's a zone. Now, if I get this cornerback or someone out here running with him, what I've done now is I told my quarterback that it's man. That somebody, again, that strong safety has to be out here to take him. If they put an end out here on him, I'm going to hit him every time. But that strong safety has to move back out here. 
to pick up him because I don't want an inner linebacker coming here. When people blitz, what happens, they end up putting an inner linebacker on him, and now I got him coming outside. I can hit him quick. Again, why would you bring the motion? You bring your motion. We talked about red zone passing. I run this in the red zone. I run this out in the field. I run this out in the field, and I run it like that up, up at the top. I run it out in the field. I run it like this with just a Z on the cross and a Y on the curl. I get down into the red zone. I take the same play, and I run it like that. The same play. The only thing I've done now is put motion with it. Why did I do that? To tell, to get them to tell me whether or not they're going man or zone. Once they tell me that they're going man or zone, now we have practiced it so the quarterback knows that in zone, I'm going here. Based on your coverage in zone, I know where he's going. Now, if they run with him in man, I know that I got man, and I like that matchup because I'm going to get him to overrun and I can come back because he's going to trail him. I like that matchup. What we will do, getting down on the goal line, you hear people say, well, you can't throw the ball down there because you're running out of room. You don't have enough room. You don't have enough field. What we, how have we shortened the field? We have shortened the field by closing our sets in. We have closed our sets in to create room. Once we come down tight inside, once we take, an, for an example, we run this out of this set also. Now, you see where the hashes are here? You see where they're lined up here? What I've done now is I've moved everything in tight to the inside. They're going to adjust down with me. Now, in the red zone, I don't usually run this out in the field. I only do this when I get down to the red zone. I'm going to tighten everything down inside. Now, once I tighten everything down inside, they're not going to stay out there wide. They're going to move in too. Now, I want to know whether they're going to be in man or zone. So I put some motion with it. I I bring him in here and take him back. I put him here and take him over there. Why am I doing that? I want to know what they're in. Also, have you ever seen the backs run out of the backfield and take off? What we'll do is that what we'll do is empty the backs. What we'll do now is that take off. Again, what they have told us is whether or not they're going to go man or zone. By going man or zone, now I tell my quarterback, if when he runs, if that linebacker or somebody runs, I know that I've got that in zone. If he sits back here, or rather, I, when he runs out here, I know I've got man, so I want to take this matchup. Now, if he drops back, I know that I've got zone, I want to come here. We will run that on the goal line so that when they start running, that receiver knows the hook up in the void area in zone. Now, what I can also do by emptying this, and you got a linebacker coming out there, I'll snap it now and I'll throw it to that back. Now that back's got that whole corner to work. And I don't feel like that linebacker's going to catch that back before he can get to that end zone. Again, it's getting him out there in a hurry. What have we done with this set? Again, we have used it out in the middle of the field to go down to the red zone. We've taken the same scheme, getting down to the red zone and tighten it up with our wide receivers and putting some motion with it or emptying the back to make us get you to declare whether you're in man or zone and now I can run the same passing game down there. What happens now, you get out on the goal line. We're working our goal line scrimmage for an example yesterday. We're in 
the jumbo set. We got three tight ends. We got a we whamming up in there, and that defense is kicking our butt. So basically, when I said, okay, we gonna keep doing this, y'all got one more scrimmage. You got one more scrimmage. We're going to keep doing it. Now, if y'all can't get in there one more scrimmage, we're going to four wide outs on the three-yard line. Why? Because now I'm spreading it out. I'm not going to, I, I didn't say I was going to throw it. I'm spreading it out because the threat of the cross. Now I can get my quarterback with Charlie Ward. I spread at the table and just let him pick a hole. With Tannehill, spread the table and he picked the hole. Also, now I got, when I spread them out, I'm not running against an eight-man front up in there. Now I can give it to that one back out of the gun going up in there. And now what I've done is just created, created some room in there to run. Again, it goes back, I guess, to philosophy. Florida State, for an example, we, when we got out on the goal line, we did not get in, into a three-tight or two-sight set. We stayed in four wide receivers on the two, on the one-yard line. First down, we give it to the back. Why we kept them spread it out? Why? As long the thing was, as long as you guys score, keep doing it. The, the minute you don't put it in in zone, we go into three tight. So we worked our butts off to get it in there, and we developed our running game off of that. Now, what do you have to complement the cross? What you have to complement it is a pattern that we call smash. The smash will complement the cross. The smash will complement the vertical that I just showed you. And it'll take, what you have to do now is figure out what they're playing. You can run the cross, the smash, and the vertical. We have gone into ball games. Again, this is when you have some pretty good football players. And you would go into the ball game and say, okay, the first series, all we're going to do will be run smash and vertical. Every other play, we're going to smash vertical, smash vertical, see if they could stop us. First time we played it, we played Virginia Tech. We say smash vertical every down. We scored two touchdowns before they stopped the first series. Just smash vertical. Why? Because in practice, we worked it. We worked it all week. And when we got to the ball game, we said, let's incorporate this particular idea. Now, <coughs> When do we decide what we're going to do? As an example, on Friday nights, for an example, when, when some of you guys have football games, we as a coaching staff will get together about 9 o'clock. We will come out of a room probably about somewhere between 1.30 and 2 o'clock in the morning. We played the entire football game. We played the entire football game. Kick off. What are we going to use on the kick? Are we bringing it back right? Where's the ball going to be on the right hash? Okay, right hash. How far do we come out? 20 yard line, 15 yard line. Okay, ball right. What's the first play? What are they going to be in? Okay, how many yards did we get? Okay, we got we got two yards. We got three. We got four. We got five. And we'll go down. Okay, we got two yards. What are we going to do? We got five yards. What are we going to do? We got eight yards. What are we going to do? And we will take it every single down all the way down the field. Now, we get down on the goal line. We get down on the goal line. What are we going to run first play on the goal line? First down on the nine. First down on eight. First down on the seven. Second down. Third down. And we will go over every scenario and exact. We have a sheet with our plays on it, exactly what we're going to run. Now, the biggest one that we'll have, fourth and one to win the game. What are you going to call? Fourth and two to win the game. Fourth and five. Fourth and eight to win the game. Do you know what you're going to call fourth down and five to win the game? We already know because we talked about it the night before. So we're not sitting there stretching our head, oh, four, oh we, what we going to do? All we do is go to our sheet. For an example, we played LSU. We can't run against them big suckers up there. West Virginia, we can't run against them big. Them people are too big. First down on the goal line, what are we going to No, we're not going to ram it. What did the sheet say? The sheet said we're going to throw it. First down on the goal line, what do we do against West Virginia? Throw the ball, touchdown. LSU, we got down there. Second down, we're going to take one shot, and then we're going to throw that sucker. We got down there, took our one shot, 
trying to run the ball. Okay, we can't get in. What are we going to do now? Throw back to the quarterback. Why? Because we're going to get that guy sucking again. We're going to get him outside, halfback pass over there. In other words, we don't have to guess what we're going to do. All we do is pull out a sheet and look at our back. Okay, this is what we said we're going to do, and let's do it. Why? It's because we've had time to think about and analyze exactly what we want to do. We've got the input of everybody. We've gone over every possible scenario that could happen on the play, so now we know exactly what we want to run, as opposed to sitting on the sideline and said, okay, I guess we'll do this. Now we have it down. Also, what we do at halftime is we bring in a stat sheet. We bring in a stat sheet. Okay, how much are we getting on this play? Okay, we ran this uh, two times, and we got eight yards both times. You mean we hadn't run it again? Let's open up the half with it. We go down the field. Oh, they can't stop it? What we've gotten into also is that sometimes you run a play and you won't repeat it. I was talking to John Reeves. We were talking about different philosophies, University of Florida. The thing that we got into, if they can't stop it, run it again. And I said, what do y'all do? If they can't stop it, we're going to run it again. We're going to see if they're going to stop it. And so sometimes we run a pass play and they don't stop it. So, okay, I'm a genius now. I'm going to go to somewhere else. And we were having a devotion the other morning, and Coach Scott was talking about there are a lot of geniuses out there looking for head coaching jobs. Why? Because they outsmart themselves. So what we're going to do now, if you can't stop it, I'm going to keep running it. We will repeat it. Now, what I want to come back with is the smash route, the compliment what I'm doing. I want to get this Z and the X out to the top of the numbers, the top of the numbers. When I run my vertical, I'm going to get them out to the top of the numbers. When I run my streams, I'm going to get them out to the top of the numbers. I'm going to move them out. Notice how I got them out to the top now. Before, when I was running my crossing series, I had them right outside the hash. When I got in the red zone, I brought them in tight. I am playing with their splits to create the kind of opening in the secondary that I want by creating room, by moving my wide receivers around. Smash, six, six. I take him up the field, and before, I brought him down in here, where he was running at uh, the vertical in the middle. Now, I'm going to take him back outside. I'm going to take him up, and I'm going to take him back outside. Now, that corner has to decide which one he's going to take. More than likely, that coach has told him to play the middle, drop back under the deep one, give him the short one. So I play this. And what I do, I start sliding him outside to make him come up and take him, to make him come and take him. So I do this. Now, I've got this throw, and I've got this throw. It's an example of philosophy. Florida and Florida State throw this same pass. At Florida State, we like to go here. At Florida, they like to go there. But the thing is, there were two highly successful programs, and talking with uh, Coach Reeves, they threw over the last, I think it's three or four years, they have thrown 52 passes, touchdown passes off of that. They've thrown 52 touchdown passes off of this.